Why is the Ganges almost over? Because the glacier is melting a thousand times faster than it was predicted to melt. To melt. So it's already gone in by about five kilometers. Now the, it's happened. Now to, in today's news, you have seen that the Alps have got no snow this year. If the Alps get no snow, Europe gets no water. So mm, it's already upon us. You know. Uh, so when we use language like, oh, in 2050 has happened, nobody for a minute believes, A, that they will die, but two, that they will ever see 2050, strangely enough. You know, both these beliefs exist in our minds. So if we can say, we are already in the middle of the climate change, we're done, we're finished. It's not only the polar bears who are hanging about in little islands. We are hanging about little islands. If I get 7 million Bangladeshi refugees per year, because Bangladesh is going down, because it's a coastal area, then my life is already over. How can I, it's, I mean, Euro can fail today, the rupee tomorrow. How can I stop revolution in my country? How can I stop anything from happening if I'm absolutely inundated with refugees? So what are we talking about? The quality of life is already over. Now it's just life we're looking at. So if we would change our language and realize that we are where we are, right in the middle of it, then perhaps people might work with a more urgency. Secondly, if we stop data collection for a little bit and just get on to action. Three, if we stop COP17, COP20, COP92 and just do it as countries, realizing that we are in the middle of a crisis and each country has to deal with it, whether legislation or force or persuasion or what, and call a moratorium, for, God, for God's sake, on population building. Instead of giving incentives to having a fifth child, as so many countries still do, and just say, okay, for the next five years, we will all not have children, and let's see what we can do with our resources then. I mean, we'll have to do something. The point is nobody's doing anything, because we all think it's still in the future. I mean, not, the day New Orleans died should have been a wake-up for everybody. The fact that Japan has let radioactive water swish about, and all of us are covering it up instead of noticing the huge amounts of fish that are washing up. If we notice the 400 black holes in the ocean caused by just urea, and the, the US and the India being the highest urea users in the world, even that we haven't stopped. Now, in all our economies, methane is playing a biofuel part. There's an intention of every country to increase methane, not decrease it, so that it takes the place of um, carbon dioxide. Hello? Does that make any sense at all? I mean, India has a proper economic plan to increase methane use. So, again, another long answer. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. And there just doesn't seem to be any short answers here. I wish I could just reply with yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll think of something. Um, the World Preservation Foundation uh, has seen a number of uh, solutions that, that can actually work. And one of them is the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency have said that the quickest way and the cheapest way to pull down carbon dioxide to stop the heating is to plant trees, to grow trees rather, and grass, to take the livestock off all the rangelands, all the pastures of the world. And that would cost only 20% of any other mitigation. Uh, in Africa, 51% of the continent is actually high rainfall savanna. That is, there's more than three quarters of a metre rainfall. And the, the, we're told that with that rainfall, if the savanna was not burned, it would return to woodland and forest. So there we have a huge potential um, huge. to soak up. It's in, in Africa, fire is used commonly to maintain pastures, to burn out old grasses. Well. Several times a year they fire. No, it's used in India as well. It's used in China. It's used all over the world. Yes. Fire is used as a method to clean up. Yeah. So, um, I, I share your concern, and I, I, but I do see these solutions are there, are readily available for us. I don't see any and solutions. Think sure. <laughs> I don't see a tree planting as a solution that will work in the After all, a tree is not a tomato plant. It doesn't grow in two months. 
I can plant a billion, million, trillion trees. And I would still have to wait 50 years for them to turn into a forest. No, I'm saying even if we let it regrow naturally or even whether we plant them, it's still not a solution that will work for me right now. It will not stop the Arctic from melting. I'm more concerned with the permafrost and the Arctic than I am with anything else. Because if they melt and we've got, still got the ozone holes there, then nothing, nothing stops uh, us from completely going over the edge. So what, give me a solution that will stop the Arctic from melting, that will keep the permafrost, keep its methane, Give me that solution. Don't give me about five putting five cattle into a room and uh, letting uh, the grass grow naturally. You know, we're, we're looking at titch button solutions. That's why NGOs do, you know, halfpenny worth of work and then congratulate themselves horribly. You know, or governments use NGO work to say how well they're doing. But what is? Tell me the one solution that will stop the Arctic. That's all. That's the one point we need to go to. Not Durban, not India, not anywhere else. Mitigation strategy from grassland. I'm just wondering if, if you could share with us your opinion of the difference of changing diet versus a no, mitigation if you, strategy. If you, don't like eat, if you don't eat, you don't have to take. You see, the Netherlands is suggesting what every country has come up with its own crackpot solution, all right, to remove 12% and 15%. U.S. says make pigs with three stomachs and cows that ha have produced less fermentation, right? All the scientific um, establishment is now working on genetic, biogenetics for animals to make them produce less methane. Netherlands, as you say, is saying let's, not take, let's take them all off the pastures and put them into rooms. The point is whether you put them into rooms or you put them outside, they're going to produce the same methane levels. Yeah? So the best is not to have them at all. And the only way you could not have them is by not eating them. So don't eat them. And by next year they won't be there. And then you can have all the pastures you want. You can have all the regeneration you want. All the fires that are set in our countries are to clean up the areas for cattle. So they won't be set anymore. So do you think the vegan solution is a real solution? I'm saying not only is it a real solution, but it's an immediate solution. Within three years, you will have given us a breather to work out the carbon dioxide problem. Here, we're not even getting the breather. Yes, um, South Africa Broadcasting. Um, there's, there's a lot of, even, even Sorry, so can you, can yeah, you my name is Judy Sol. I'm on assignment for 5050 SABC TV 2. Um, there's a lot of people who, uh, in, in the main plenary discussions, the fact that methane is not on the table is, is, is really ridiculous. But even what is on the table, the fact that there is so much contesting of, of, of everything that is trying to prevent us from using a fossil fuel based society, um, it does, doesn't make sense. Have you, uh, there's a lot of people who have, as a result, come to think of it as like a conspiracy that there's actually, the government's actually working for the oil companies and we just fools who just go along with it and we believe we have democracy because we get a vote once every five years. Is there any other reason that you can think of why no, the world would actually choose to actually, I mean, those people who are in there discussing nothing except money, surely they either, they either don't believe it or there's some other agenda. Have you got any idea what it could be? And the second question is the C. I'm really very worried about our situation in the sea. Can you just tell me what you would have told us if you'd had more time last night about the sea? Well, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that why are people quarreling? It's like cop because not a single one knows what they're saying. They're all career diplomats, career bureaucrats, and career politicians. None of whom are scientists, and none of whom have actually got any positions except um, country positions, which are that I will, do, I will take home more than the other. If you look at the COP from 1 to 17, the same person hasn't attended the next COP, either the same minister nor the same bureaucrat. Most of them, like for instance in India, the person who's coming here was appointed last week. So hasn't got a position at all, except I won't do what my predecessor did. So what you're dealing with is people who are talking 
about matters they knew nothing about. And to an audience which is not in Durban, but in their own countries. And it's about a subject that cannot be dealt with, as I said before. Why would I quarrel with you? And why would I keep quarreling with you? Unless I, A, I didn't know what I was talking about. Two, I didn't know what I wanted. What do we want with carbon dioxide? As I said, what is the position? What are we quarreling about? Not one person uh, at COP17 is saying, all right, I will do this. Let's quarrel about this. Shall we put off coal first or cars first? That hasn't even come to the table. The quarrel is, you have more carbon dioxide than I have. Therefore, you must allow me to have as much carbon dioxide as you have before I mitigate it. That is the quarrel. Right? To put it simply. Now that has half the world on one side and half the world on the other. Now that is not a bridge you can, we, you can divide because the developed world is saying, okay, we've made the mistakes, please don't make them again. We will pay you money not to do it. And the developing world is saying, I know, I'm sorry, that's too late. I can't go back with just this much money. If you give me this much money, I'll think about it. But in actual fact, I'm not going to change because I'm going to do what you did. That's the only quarrel. So the actual nitty gritty in COP17 or COP1, COP8, COP10, Rio, wherever you, Kyoto, Copenhagen, has not even come onto the table for negotiating. Which is, all right, am I putting a moratorium? You will be allowed to have 500,000 cars and I will be allowed to have 500,000 cars. Fine. Now let's talk about this. But that hasn't even come onto the table. Okay, you will be allowed to have 400 coal-based plants and I will be allowed to have 400 coal-based plants. Once you get to actuals, then there will be no more quarreling, then we're dealing. And we will be able to reach a sensible solution. But we haven't even reached the point of dealing. Because there's nothing to deal with. We are, what, what we're actually doing is saying, I'm going to do what you're going to do. And you're saying, no, you're not going to do what I'm going to do. And I'll pay you not to do it, but my money is very little because my euro is going down the drain and I've got a recession going on in the US. So I'm going to give you very little. End of problem. So that is the problem. That is the reason why a COP is achieving nothing. The second is about the sea, the ocean. You mean the ocean? Yeah. The ocean, unless you stop fishing, is dead. Unless you stop using it as the largest garbage dump on the earth, it's dead. Unless you start uh, saying that using it as a resource, as a permanent oxygen sink, rather than a fish catching uh, country, you're finished. After all, if I use urea, it all pours into the ocean. But I'm not the only one. You're, you're pouring cyanide into the ocean, you're pouring your oil into the ocean, you're pouring everything into the ocean as we speak, every minute of the day. So it's not holding up at all. 400 black holes, each black hole is between 100 kilometers to 200 kilometers, which means we're looking at, what is a black hole? It's a hole that goes from the ocean floor to the top. And within it, there is no oxygen, there's not even this much signs of life. It is like a, a dead star. No fish will go through it. Nobody can enter it. If you go in, you may not come out. And it has only been created by an, ex an excess of algae, which were created by the chemicals we put in. And they destroyed the ocean, that part of it, till no fish, nothing exists in it. Now, these are not reparable. They will be there forever. And you had 16 six years ago. You have 400 now. So how long is it going to be because the whole of the ocean is a black hole? Where will our water come from? After all, your clouds pick up water from the ocean and give it to us as fresh water. Where, where will we get water from if it's all a black hole? So the ocean is not, um, is not something that we can even save. After all, your corals are almost all white now. And they are the biggest bioindicators. You, you have to stop fishing. You have to stop using it as a garbage dump. It's easily done. It's, if you just stop fishing, you stop fishing. After when they said, you can't kill whales, then everybody stopped killing whales, except Japan and Norway. So there are things that have to be done by executive order. But they're not even on the table as yet. Nobody is saying stop fishing. They're looking at quotas. You've fished out the Arctic, so you go to the Pacific. 
You fish down the Pacific, now you go to the Indian Ocean. So, I don't really have much hope. But in any case, all of it becomes irrelevant when the Arctic ice melts. So, I know, so boring, so despondent. I wish I, wish I could say something so happy that we would all be jumping about for joy. From the message that is coming from your side, uh, it's more, I would imagine, of an appeal to an individual, you know, your ordinary man in the street, um, to say, change your lifestyle, uh, basically, something that I'm very much for. But it's a case of um, how realistic is that? Um, and because it's one thing to say, hey, you know, let's look that way. For no, me, it's a case of how. How do we? How do we? You know, if we were to just put simple, realistic steps for an so ordinary person. So what I'm what I'm saying is, don't change your lifestyle. That's that's the thing that everybody doesn't understand. Carbon, the carbon dioxide quarrelers, the ones that have taken carbon dioxide as their main message, are saying change your lifestyle, which is what nobody's prepared to do, including me. If you tell me don't go for a holiday, uh, you know, roam around in the dark. Go to sleep before six so that because there's no electricity after six, I'm not going to do it. Right? I mean Greece was dying and it still wouldn't change its lifestyle, right? So I'm saying have as many cars as you want, put all the electricity on, do what you want, don't change your lifestyle, except in one small fashion. Don't eat meat. That's what I'm saying. Don't eat fish. Now that is the least of your lifestyle changes. If but, but I asked what, what, you, yes. no, if I asked you a simple question, give me a choice, whether you will use your car or whether you will eat meat. If you eat meat, you will not get a car and you will not get buses, you will not get transport. Which one would you choose? Well, look, um, it sounds all simplistic the way you... No, I'm just it's saying, quite simple. Yeah, it's yeah, quite simple because yeah. one says, I'm saying use as much carbon dioxide as you want, mm. give up the methane. Now you have to take a choice. Mm. Obviously, anybody will say, no, a car represents for me freedom. Travel represents for me liberty. Whereas, uh, meat is irrelevant if I have great vegetables, if I have great uh, food to eat, if I have mock meat, if I have things that taste the same as meat. After all, it's taste that you're worried about, right? And what we're saying is that without the methane content, we can give you the same meat, because that is where technology has already reached. So, what would you rather give up? See, what, what I'm trying to say, ma'am, is that uh, look, I'm talking as a man in the street, somebody that lives in yeah, an ordinary community where, for whatever reason, over the last, I don't know how many years now, people's diet is so much made of, you know, stuff from meat. Essentially, you Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Now, th that is a radical change from, to, to say to somebody, I mean, as you know, but South Africa is But I need fed. to present it, governments need to present it as an either or solution. Sure. If you do meat and cars, you die. So now you do meat, meat or cars, meat or electricity, and you live, and you live well. Which one would you choose? I, tell me. Well, I, I know what, what you need to, but I'm saying, practically speaking, for, for an ordinary So guy, then we be practical, for an we don't guy, die. Who, wherever he goes, there's a KFC, there's a McDonald's there, there's this, there. But that's there because you, know, you eat it. So if we were to say to them, guys, nice, this is what we should be doing, a step-by-step -step process. There's no step-by-step um, -step time now. Of, of living or, or, or living off. I'm saying this, we are trying to do a step-by-step. -step. We are saying, after I'm not standing here with a stick and making a, we are presenting to you delicious alternatives. We are presenting to you, after we are all as well-dressed, we, are, we live just as well. There are no aging hippies here. We are all reasonably good in our professions. All we're saying is we do not believe in destroying the earth. And we believe that if you remove methane, methane you can do well. That's all we're asking you to do is to bring it onto the table. And this step-by-step -step approach has been tried for carbon dioxide. It hasn't worked for even one step. After all, after spending something like a hundred trillion dollars, you still solar energy is still three percent of the world's total electricity mix. So that's step by step. That's a step by step approach. So no doubt, by the time we all die, it will reach five percent. So what we're saying is, governments now have to take a decision and say that no, no meat now. 
Why do gov don't governments say no drugs, no cooking? Some governments will at some point say no smoking, hopefully. So why don't they just say uh, no, no meat? Or not no meat, I'm saying. No meat export. You want to eat meat, produce it yourself. You'll find half of the world can't produce it. Yeah, briefly, just to follow up on what um, this is. My name is Melanie St. James. I'm, I'm here from Empowerment Works. We're based in California. We're a global sustainability think tank in action. And the first thing I'm hearing is that there's a lack of evidence-based policy making. And so, um, Madam Gandhi, from your experience, um, long experience in government in India, um, what do you feel would enable, what mechanisms could on a national level, like you said, so we can take action, each country do what they can. What have you seen to be effective? And also in regards to what is culturally relevant and normal, um, just wanted to call attention to Dr. Mienge's presentation yesterday about the proteins that have been traditionally in the African diet and actually that the meat consumption is more of a neo-colonial um, consumer, based strategy and marketing um, from globalization and you know the evidence of that historically and how that has really become more of a market trend rather than our own culture here or the culture here so the question is what should governments do is that the question how can evidence become part of the policy making framework the first thing is to you know i'll, I'll tell you a story i know whether it should be on television but it's a correct story when I was 32, I was Minister for Environment and I was sent off to fight and to work the Montreal Protocol because India was holding up the entire agreement. So before I left, I asked the Prime Minister, what should I say? And he said, I don't care, say anything. And <laughs> so I actually studied and we managed to get the protocol through. But that were my specific directions. I don't care, do what you like. So the first thing is perhaps to bring these up in all parliaments. Let people bring up methane for debate. Let everybody realize the seriousness of the situation. And then let governments sit together and work at it in their own way. If some people want to do coal first, let them do coal. If some people want to stop meat export, as India should. If some people want to reduce leather, then put moratoria on, for instance, no leather to be worn by children on school shoes. No leather to be worn here or there or what, whatever, you know, in large groupings. Now those things are, can be uh, adjudicated executively. For instance, the Supreme Court in America has ruled that vegetables have to be um, given to children in schools. Now after the Supreme Court has made its decision about giving vegetables to children in schools, the American government has allowed pizzas to be called vegetables. So, uh, so, I mean, you have to make up your mind. But things can be done by governments. And the rest is, of course, if one person stops eating meat, you, that's 15,000 less animals being born. So if each one says, okay, I'm not stopping it from today, then you make a huge difference, huge. If you instead say, oh no, I won't eat cattle from today, but I'll eat chickens, then you are creating a bigger crisis because for every bit of chicken, you have to have te 10 more chickens than you have to have a cow. And if cattle release, one cow releases 600 liters of methane, a chicken releases 250. So you actually at the same crisis. So you have to, each person has to now make up their mind for themselves. But yes, governments, I don't know how governments can do it. I know how Indi the Indian government can do it. Bring it into parliament, let it be talked through, let decisions be made executively, and they will be followed. Um, it seems very strange but that a, a whole conference on global warming actually ends up with the governments talking about money. But that's, that seems what they're talking about. They're not really talking about saving our planet, they're talking about money. And it leads you to begin, especially with all the things that have been happening with the world of money, and you begin to realize money is really a scam, isn't it? It's just a way of controlling the resources of the world. No, but they're talking about money because there's nothing else to talk about. If I say that I'm going to pollute as much as you pollute, and you pay me for not polluting, then the answer is money. But how do you stop 
see the people giving the money the united states was giving a polluter fund right now i know in india that you did the stupidest things and then you claim that money so you didn't actually make any difference suppose i was running a shop and i decided instead of giving plastic bags out i gave paper bags out then i would get money from the polluter fund suppose i grew 15 trees in my backyard i could then claim money from the polluter fund So if you're going to throw money about like that, then the talk will always be about money because it's never enough. But there's no way in which the people taking the money are using it sensibly, and there's no way that the people giving the money can 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 or even should give it. All right, I made a mistake. I polluted the planet. Why should I give you money now not to pollute it? You do it yourself because in any case we're going to die. Maybe because of my mistake, but you're dying just as much. The thing that also worries me about money is it's a means of of certain very few individuals controlling the world, and so we I, haven't we never get get that far because there's never enough money. So how do they control the world? They just When, create more. No, America gives the money, but they give it to the Indian government. For instance, the Indian government disperses it like a normal lunatic would, which means straight into the dustbin. You know, in terms of paper bag replacements or other rubbish. So nobody controls anybody. It's just money for jam. No, you just throw it away. Do you foresee us ever living in a world without money? Because I think that's the solution. Because then it no, changes the power. I don't. I don't. I, I would. I would be hard put to put. Um, get up every morning and say, okay, how much does this cost that I can exchange for an egg, or not? Um, I'd have to reevaluate everything I own, and it would open up huge, huge exploitation of mines. It would lead to more wood cutting. Because then you're exchanging the barter system in this day and age, with our mentality, would destroy the world in three and a half minutes flat. Why would it have to be barter at all? Why do you have to value it everything? Why don't we just put in because we want to? Because we just want to contribute something to the planet. Because when we were doing that, there were probably one million people on the planet, and now there are seven billion, and I can't see seven billion people. I'm actually negotiating a lack of of tender, legal tender. Thank you. Are there any further questions from Madam Gandhi? We should go to Daniel now. He probably has far more sensible things to say. <laughs> I just want to ask us. Uh, we, uh, my name is Jean. Uh, we run a small farm in Canada, and uh, one of the problems uh, is we sell two tomatoes, and that costs people a dollar. And they go a dollar for two tomatoes. I can go get a hamburger at McDonald's or you know another place for a dollar. And this is caused by subsidies. This problem of uh, I want to grow and export peas. I have to buy land, put in the pea seeds, harvest them, can them, send them abroad, all at my own expense. But if I want to export meat, the uh, I grow the meat. When I say grow the meat, the goat can graze free on government land, denuding all the hills and villages uh, of their rightful pastures. It's free. I then uh, take it to a government slaughterhouse, where it costs me one rupee. That's about one cent or two cents to get each goat killed and cleaned and packed for me. And I then export it. And for every meat uh, goat that I export, I get an incentive of double of what it cost me. And if I want to set up a slaughterhouse myself, I get a free loan from the not loan. I get a free grant from the government of 20 million rupees, and I can set it up, and I don't have to repay the loan. So that is the kind of incentive I have for creating meat and for feeding the rest of the world. So as a result, I have no forests left. I have no pastures left. Oh, absolutely. There's a demand for it, but there's a demand for it because I've created it. I, if I'm giving to them free, I give it. I give you a one kilo of meat at at twenty cents. So obviously there will be a demand for a twenty cent meat, and I can give it to you at twenty cents because the pasture has come free, the forest has come free, people's water has come free. I have created only death and devastation in the villages. Because they have no plants left, they have no water left because of the goats. We have whole, uh, um, what you call it, mountain ranges like the Aravallis, which have not got one plant on them left anymore. I, my sewage systems are blocked up with blood. Everything, and that's why I can sell meat for 20 cents a kilo, which is what I'm doing.
that is why I'm feeding the whole of the Middle East. So if I remove those subsidies and said, okay, you want to grow goats, you tether those goats, you feed them on, uh, on food that you've grown yourself. You will use your own slaughterhouse and you will pay this much money for the slaughterhouse. You will look after your own sewage boy. You will um, do everything that I do as a vegetarian to grow food. And when you send it abroad, you are not giving you an incentive to export it. You export it and whatever money you get, you know, good for you. Then my meat instead of 20 cents will cost $200. And then nobody, there will be no demand for it, I show you. Thank you, Madam Gandhi.